Hello, hello, hello. Today we are going to continue to focus on the progressive era, approximately 1890s to 1920, and we will focus this time on women and their role during the progressive movement, the progressive era. They are going to be leading forces, leading forces behind the temperance movement, women's suffrage movement, the birth control movement, and finally, the labor movement. Let us begin. Women and the progressive movement. In many ways, as I said before, women are the driving force behind the progressive movement. Uh, goals of American women within this movement during this time, clean drinking water, uh, trash collection, hot lunches at schools, community playgrounds, fire codes for buildings, uh, public libraries, etc. However, they will also take on other issues like female voting rights, the abolition of alcohol, uh, birth control reform, and labor rights. And these are the things that we will focus on today. What was the role of women in the 1800s, early 1900s. Well, primarily, ideally, they were considered the moral guardians and protectors of the home, protectors of the family. If the outside world was the men, man's sphere, inside the home, this was the woman's sphere. However, as we move to the late 1800s, early 1900s, many women begin to take this position of moral guardians of the family, the uh, protectors of the home, outside of the home. They argue clean water, libraries, the abolition of alcohol affects what's inside the home. But I have to be vocal. I have to take to the streets. I have to get involved in community uh, organization in order to protect this home. So that traditional role of being protector of the home, protectors of everything moral and, 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 and familial, that position is broadened during the progressive era. The organizations that we're going to talk about that affect so much change during the progressive era really gets their roots in the club movement of the 1800s. Now in the 1800s, the club movement was women organizing into clubs uh, for one social reasons, but for two, to make the world a better place. This is the 1800s. And so women would organize into clubs to um, discuss their Christian faith, perhaps to organize charity, but also to tackle social issues. So this club movement of the 1800s is going to evolve and transform itself into many of the organizations that we're going to see emerge during the progressive era. The woman's sphere is the home crossed out wherever she makes good. The home, law, industry, schools, the stage, business, the arts, we're moving from protecting what's inside the home to going outside of the home to affect real change. This is that shift in the uh, organization of these women during this time. The status of women in the progressive era. Well, their position and their status is going to change dramatically during this time. But just know that in 1900, in many states, women could still not vote, uh, serve on juries, own property without sharing it with their husband, enter into legal contracts without their husband. As for work, women of the middle class and the upper class did not work for the most part. Uh, that was reserved for the lower classes, uh, poor immigrants, widows, Young single women, once you uh, found a, a good match in a marriage, you were expected to no longer work. So please remember this, that all of these reform movements, for the most part, are being led by upper and middle class women because they have something that working class women don't have, and that is free time.
that allows them to get involved, to demand change, to sign petitions, to go on marches. Middle class and upper class women will lead these movements. Again, working class women don't have time. The new woman, the new woman. This will terrify some men and women. In the early 1900s, a new sort of female is emerging, mostly from the middle and upper classes. Uh, more and more women are graduating from university. More and more women are entering jobs reserved for men, such as lawyers, doctors, journalists, scientists, politicians. The press dub these women the new woman and it terrifies it terrifies many men oftentimes the bicycle is a symbol of the new woman because they in order to ride these bicycles wear trousers this was unheard of some counties even banned women being allowed to dress as men and why they did this they were targeting women wearing trousers who wears the trousers in the family? Well, this woman does. She's a new woman. She's college educated. She thinks for herself. She might wait in order uh, uh, to get married. She might wait until she's 30. My God. My God. She might choose not to have children. My God. What in the heck is happening here? The new woman. Have dinner ready at one o'clock, John. <laughs> the new woman on wash day. You watch that, buddy. I'm going out and riding my bicycle. You see the bike in the background? Is this what's going to be the future? Is this our future, gentlemen? Now, these are all made in tongue-in-cheek, but there's a fear there. There is an anxiety there. The reason these things are selling, uh, because there's truth to it in the eyes and minds of many men and women, for the record. Now, women of the reform movement will take on, uh, uh, of the progressive era, will take on many crusades. And they see it as a crusade. This is, this is literally a, a, a holy crusade against the ills of society. The Woman's Holy War. And one of the larger targets of this holy crusade of women was with liquor. Now, saloons had been built across the country over the 18. Hundreds, it became a meeting house for working men. Now, if you're wealthy, you might have the country club, you might have the boat club, but for working men in the factories, in the mines, this was where they went to escape. Many men became drunkards in the 1800s, and many women and men saw the solution to what is ailing society was in banning alcohol, banning alcohol. If we ban alcohol, we can fix so many of society's issues. The first movement that we're going to look at is the temperance movement. What does temperance mean? It means um, abstaining from alcohol, usually by banning it. We're going to ban alcohol. Hun rule association. We make people poor. We cause poverty and crime. We are against progress. We rob women and children. We fill penitentiaries and asylums. We waste grain, waste and ruin the army of alcohol. Members of the temperance movement believe that if we wiped out liquor traffic, we can wipe out 80% of all crime. This is a perfect example of the road to ruin of alcohol. This man comes home from the bar drunk. He spent the rent money. The woman, the protector of the home, confronts him. He doesn't like this and because he's drunk. He proceeds to beat her. That young man there is going to believe that this is the way a man behaves. That woman is going to think it's okay for a man to do that to his wife. That young man is going to grow up to be a drunkard. That young lady is going to grow up to marry a drunkard. If we ban alcohol, we will end prostitution, burglaries, murder, domestic abuse, at least a great deal of it. 
can be tied to alcoholism as well as insanity was tied to alcoholism as well. Boys, you might think that a few drinks here and there is okay, but that is the drunkard's progress. You see, what goes up must come down. The road to ruin is in the glass of a whiskey jar. And who suffers? Who suffers? There on the bottom, the wife and child. Young men wanted to enlist in the great army of drunkards, bums, tramps, criminals, lunatics, paupers, loafers, etc. Apply here. You are, you are headed for prison, the asylum, the poorhouse. <clears throat> the saloon keeper pretends to be your friend. He pretends to be your buddy. He is stealing from you. He's stealing your future. He's stealing your, your children's dinner. At least the highwayman robs you honestly. He puts a gun in your face and he says, give me your money. This guy pretends to listen to your problems. He pretends to be your friend. And he does the same thing. He's robbing you. And moreover, he's robbing your wife and your children. A week's wages goes to the saloon keeper and who suffers? Who suffers? The woman and the children. Who pays? Your family pays. Wanted a father. Temperance movement begins really in the early 1800s. It will build over the 1800s. By the late 1800s, we have temperance groups going to schools, educating young children where they would sign a pledge to never drink. Things really come to a head with the establishment of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Francis Willard will be the leader and the face of this organization for 19 years. At one time, the Women's Christian Temperance Union had 150,000 dues paying members they were influential in convincing many states and finally the federal government to ban alcohol the women's Con uh, christian temperance union see this as a holy crusade you are doing god's work by preaching out against liquor members were expected to take the pledge not only are you expected not to drink but you have to Help convince others to do the same. It's not good enough that you're not going to drink. You have to help other people be good. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Take the pledge. Rallies across the country. Women would stand outside of saloons singing Christian songs writing names down. Sometimes women would actually enter these bars and begin destroying the liquor. Now, this is a time where a man did not touch a woman who was not his wife. And so many men just would have to stand there and watch uh, these crusaders destroy their establishment. The most infamous of these Christian crusaders was Kerry Nation. Kerry Nation was the scourge of many saloons in uh, and around the state of Kansas. She would enter these saloons armed with her hatchet and her Bible, or her tomahawk rather, and destroy these bars. This is a Christian crusade. She was arrested many times, very proudly arrested. There she is eyeing up a window. 150,000 dues-paying members, not to mention the people that were sympathetic or would attend meetings outside of being members. This is a giant movement that builds over the 1800s and the early 1900s. For God and home and every land. Don't divorce this movement from their Protestant Christian beliefs. This is a Protestant Christian movement in this country. Always in the name of protecting the children. Always in the name of protecting children. For the children's sake, destroy the liquor traffic. No beer, dad. 
We want milk. We want milk. They would publish stories, oftentimes exaggerated, not always, of children who become alcoholics. The kids are becoming drunkards because this stuff is so readily available. Something needs to be done. The only real solution is banning it. They would hold rallies, have parades, trying to convince the American people that the way that we fix this, the way that we fix this is through prohibition, through temperance. State by state begins to listen. State by state begins to ban alcohol, but that's not enough. We need, we need from sea to shining sea, a ban on alcohol. 18 states have already done it. Come on, guys, save our boys and girls. Liquor means alcohol. Alcohol means poison. Why drink poison, gentlemen? They would enter saloons. They would enter bars. This man does not seem that bothered, to be honest. <laughs> now, in the late 1800s, the Anti-Saloon League emerges. Now, this is a male organization. They're going to team up with the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, and so this is not just going to be a women's movement. It'll be spearheaded by women in, 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 in the 1800s. Now men are getting involved as well. This, this anti-saloon league is going to grow quite large as well. And like their female counterparts, they're going to tell voters to vote dry. Ban liquor. That's what that voting dry means. The saloon backer is a traitor to his country. If you vote... To keep alcohol in your state, you are literally a traitor. Who are you going to vote for? Who are you going to vote for? The saloon keeper or dear mother? It is up to you, voter, to decide. Vote dry. Which gets your vote, mother or the saloon? Vote dry. Help me to keep pure. Please vote against the sale of liquors over and over again. The family, children are used. Vote dry for us, gentlemen. Vote dry for us. This is a map of uh, 1917 showing that the only states that had full liquor throughout the counties would be Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Nevada. Every other state either has completely banned it or county by county has banned it. We want to make all, we want to make all of this map white. Full prohibition. Let's put it in our constitution. Make the map all white. 36 states can do it. This is county by county breakdown of prohibition, abolition, not abolition, pardon me, temperance in this country. Protect our American youth from the saloon by endorsing national constitutional prohibition. In 1919, the United States does, in fact, introduce prohibition. We will examine the effects of that prohibition, but we can see this is a pure progressive movement this idea that government can step in and through legislation fix the ills of society this is quintessential progressive uh, uh, legislation another key movement another movement pardon me another movement where women play a key role a pivotal role is the women's suffrage movement the idea here the belief here allowing women the right to vote from sea to shining sea would greatly improve society. Why ignore 50% of the population? And furthermore, if women are in fact the guardians of the home, politicians aren't going to listen to them. They don't vote. And so in order to wait for women to protect the home, to protect the family, to protect the children, they need to be heard. The women's suffrage movement. Suffrage simply means voting. The women's suffrage movement gets its beginning in the abolitionist movement of the early 1800s, the anti-slavery movement. Within this movement, many women realized 
that even within the abolitionist movement, they're barred from leadership roles. Many times they can't vote within committees within these organizations. And they come to believe that granting women the right to vote is just as important as the abolition, the ending of American slavery. So it breaks off from the abolitionist movement. They continue to support the abolition of, 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 of slavery in this country, but now they're arguing on top of this, allow women the vote. When black men are given the right to vote with the 15th Amendment, many women within this movement were disgusted because they expected women to be attached to that legislation, but it was too early. It was far too early. Things kick off in 1848 with Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton at the Seneca Falls Convention, 1848. It is here where they draw up a manifesto and affix their signatures to this manifesto, women and men demanding equality before the law and the right to vote for women. This is, if you can put your finger on the women's rights movement in this country, this is a nice way to do it. Seneca Falls Convention, 1848. And this movement will build and build and build. The United States and Great Britain, by the way, will have its own suffragette movement. We know that in the late 1800s, early 1900s, many Western states had already granted women full suffrage, meaning they can vote in county, state, and federal elections. But that is not good enough. That is not good enough. We want it from sea to shining sea. We want to rise, raise our citizenry. We want equality and we want the vote. We were voters out West. Why deny our rights in the East? These women are asking a simple question. The National American Women's Suffrage Association emerges in the early 1900s. Thousands of women will join this organization. Votes for women led by middle and upper class women. Again, they have the free time to do so. Here is your membership card, a small fee. They publish newspapers, pamphlets, marches, speeches on the corner, votes for women, votes for women. There was a massive march in D.C. in 1913 of suffragettes, as they were known. In 1917, in New York, women carried with them uh, signatures of over a million women demanding the vote. Protests in front of the White House. Women were arrested for protesting in front of the White House. Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? Our boys are currently dying in Europe, fighting against tyranny. And at home, 50% of the population cannot exercise the right to vote. Mr. President, you say liberty is the fundamental demand of the human spirit. Well, what about us? What about us? Mr. President, what will you do for woman suffrage? Florence. Hiles was arrested, picketing the White House. Lucy Burns was arrested in D.C. Women went on hunger strikes while in prison. In England, a, a woman was killed when she ran in front of a horse owned by the king. There's a giant horse race in England, and she runs in front of the horse, and she is trampled, uh, protesting women not having the vote. To ask freedom for women is not a crime. Suffrage prisoners should not be treated as criminals. Now, many men, not all men, but many men opposed women's suffrage. Women were pure creatures. If they are allowed to enter politics, they'll be soiled. This is a common belief. Their attention will no longer be on the home, on the children. It will rather be in national politics. We don't want that. Many women argued against suffrage 
for the same reason. Oh, save us, senators, from ourselves. This is what we'll have when we give votes to women. Vote no on women's suffrage. This is what happens. This is what happens as women move towards becoming a new woman. They move further and further away from the home, from children, from marriage, from love, towards a career, professional uh, triumph, flattery, strife, anxiety, loneliness. You see, they're moving farther and farther away from the family. This is an anti-suffrage event held in New York in 1913. These women are arguing against suffrage. Election Day. I warned you. I warned you guys. I want to vote, but my wife won't let me. Everybody works, but mother, she's a suffragette. Did I save my country for this? Nevertheless, this movement's going to grow across the country. Keep cool. There'll be nothing to worry about after we get votes for women. We need to paint the entire map white. And we do. We do. In 1920, when we ratify the Constitution to allow women to vote. And the country is going to change. And more and more laws will be focused on protecting children, the family, the environment. That is one of the effects of allowing women a voice within politics. It does change the laws in which uh, uh, we see emerge in this country. Women in the progressive movement also worked on reforming aspects of marriage, family, sex. Not all women were involved in these movements, just like not all women were involved in the temperance movement or the suffragette movement. But a great deal of attention was focused on marriage, family, and sex. When it came to marriage, many members of the progressive movement argued for what they called compassionate marriages, where every decision was made equally, and where a man listened to his wife. He co-ruled co co-ruled the home alongside his wife. Other women worked to ensure that men were held to the same standards when it came to sexuality, uh, uh, sleeping around, remaining pure and virginal before marriage. Others fought for increased parental rights for wives uh, within marriages. This is a time where if a man decided the children were going to attend a certain school or if, 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 there was a divorce, which was rare. Um, it always was in favor of the man. We're trying to reform these uh, uh, realities. And again, many women within this movement fought for uh, easier divorces when they were allowed. When it came to sex, some women worked to censor pornography and prostitution. Some women fought to raise the age of consent in many states in the Union. It was quite young, 13, 14. We want to raise the age of consent. And others fought for access to safe, affordable, and reliable birth control. The birth control movement. This is founded during the progressive era. The belief was this that birth control would prevent poverty and allow women to control their own destiny. There had been long-standing techniques for birth control uh, for centuries. The rhythm method, withdrawal, diaphragms, uh, sponges, condoms. But women within this movement fought for better, more reliable birth control. And many of these methods uh, became illegal to teach women about. Women within this movement saw this as a social issue. It doesn't just affect the woman, although that should certainly be a focus. It affects society. Without birth control, there's no family planning. And so what you get are unwanted pregnancies. 
unwanted children. The more children you have, the more you have to work to pay to maintain these kids. So it creates a cycle of poverty. You have a great many children in order to feed the kids, they have to work. The kids don't go to school. They grow up poor and ignorant, and they'll have many children as well. And so this increases crime, this increases vice, and it increases poverty. If we can safely deliver birth control to American women, we can fix society. Has a mother the right to decide how many children she will have? Is that not her right? Members of this movement believe it certainly, certainly is. We need to properly plan the number of children we have to break that cycle of poverty and to lower crime. Now, the birth control movement really is a reaction against the Comstock Act of 1873, named after Anthony Comstock of New York. The Comstock Act came about in 1873 to combat obscenity, to combat pornography. You see, with the advent of photography and the American Civil War, we have the birth of American pornography. I'm not going to show you the images. You can look it up if you want. Don't, actually. I'm not recommending that. <laughs> when you have soldiers away from their loved ones uh, uh, out in the field, you will have men that will sell them pornography. Um, it's not just photographs. Uh, erotica, those are naughty stories. All of these things are seen as lowering our morality, lowering our standards. And in 1873, Congress, under the Comstock Act, made it illegal to send, quote, obscene, lewd, or lascivious, immoral, indecent publications through the mail. But this goes even further. The law also made it a misdemeanor for anyone to sell, give away, or possess an obscene book, pamphlet, picture, drawing, or advertising advertisement it goes even further the legislation including writings or instruments concerning contraception abortion even if written by a physician you can't have anything related to birth control abortionates anything it was believed by some that Birth control actually encourages prostitution because with birth control and abortion, women will continue to sell themselves and thus creating another cycle of poverty and disease and calamity. And so if we get rid of birth control, people will enter into marriages and have children the so-called right way, the Comstock Act. After this was passed, they designated Comstock as special agent in the United States Post Service to inspect and enforce this law. And he was very proud of the fact that thousands, tens of thousands of so-called obscene material was burned by the U.S. government. They had no strict definition of what was obscene. So it was really up to the agent. And remember, this includes birth control material, whether it was written by a physician or not. This leads us to Margaret Sanger. She is one of the leaders of the birth control movement, perhaps the best known, although she will be inspired by Emma Goldman, the anarchist, the woman who encouraged the death or the shooting of Frick, the woman who many believed was responsible for convincing the man uh, who killed McKinley to pull the trigger, propaganda of the deed. Emma Goldman was a big advocate for the birth control movement. Margaret Sanger was a nurse, and she begins publishing articles on birth control. She gives uh, advice. She gives special instruction through the U.S. mail and through her newspaper, the or her pamphlet, rather, her periodical, the Birth Control Review. You see, women are slaves to unwanted babies. She quite illegally begins distributing this material. She gives lectures. She opens up a birth control clinic in New York. Illegal, but she does this. She is committed to legalizing birth control in this country. She also uses this argument. Abortions are dangerous. We don't want abortions. If you deny women 
the right to access birth control. All you're doing is encouraging these very dangerous abortions where oftentimes the woman dies as well. This is a page from Sanger's Family Limitation, 1917. She's arrested. She is arrested. And her trial, her trial becomes something of a sensation. The judge says, listen, if you promise to stop your actions, I'll let you go. Come on. Come on. She's found guilty. She's at sentencing. She replied to the judge, I cannot respect the law as it exists today. That's her way of saying I'm going to continue. She's given 30 days. She's given 30 days in jail. That being said, that being said, following this trial, New York State is one of the first to allow birth control to be distributed by a physician. Many states until the 1960s will not allow this, but her trial greatly popularizes the movement, and New York State becomes a state where, in fact, a physician can distribute material uh, 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 related to birth control. She will continue well into the 30s and 40s, speaking and preaching on the necessity of birth control in this country, the family limitation movement. Sanger was also a firm believer in something called eugenics. She's one of the leaders of this movement. This is also a movement within the progressive era. Eugenics. What does eugenics mean? Well, eugenics is Greek for well-born. Some progressives saw eugenics as a solution to excessively large or underperforming families, put plainly. You see, this is... Eugenics works two ways. A, for fit people, for smart people, we want them to breed more. However, for unfit people, in the eyes of followers of eugenics, we want them to breed less. You have positive eugenics and negative eugenics. Supporters of eugenics wanted both, and they wanted to actually make it law in this country. You see, supporters of eugenics would tell you this. For hundreds of thousands of years, Mother Nature, in survival of the fittest, created eugenics, supported eugenics. If you were slow, if you were dim, if you couldn't outrun the lion, Mother Nature takes care of it. Hopefully, in the eyes of a follower of eugenics, it takes care of you, meaning you die, before you can breed more. This is how a natural selection works. For hundreds of thousands of years, Mother Nature did this. If you couldn't catch enough fish or hunt enough buffalo, you died before you could reproduce. However, however, there's a problem. Through charities, through welfare, through new technologies and better medicine, more and more people that would have been dead a hundred years ago are alive and they're breeding and they're unfit. And they literally pointed to rats. What do you do if you have a rat problem? Well, if you feed the rats, are they not going to breed more and more and more? This is what supporters of eugenics said. We have Ended natural selection. We need to introduce artificial selection. This is the practice of negative eugenics. Our orphanages are full. Our prisons are full. Our insane asylums are full. When is someone going to fix this? When are we going to end these unfit people from reproducing? This is what a follower of eugenics would have said. Supporters of eugenics went and they studied great families. And they said the reason why, and I mean great, I mean wealthy, prestigious families, influential families, they go back hundreds of years and they say, you see, it's all through genes. It's all because of genes that these great people, these great families exist. However, however, and they argued, if one of these people 
breed with someone who's not fit, then their offspring very well likely will be unfit. They will breed with someone who's unfit and so on and so forth. And so you see here, this is a normal family. This is a normal family. This was based on a real family, the uh, Kalakak family. And what happened was a normal bred with a so-called feeble. They had a feeble. And even if they bred with another normal, this is a real family, feeble, feeble. This is how you destroy an entire bloodline. And this is how we're destroying the country because we're allowing those Fs to breed much more than the Ns are. Who were your supporters of eugenics? Well, there were some very notable supporters. Uh, Margaret Sanger, of course, Theodore Roosevelt was a supporter. Uh, Winston Churchill was a supporter. Who else? Uh, George Bernard Shaw. There were a great many supporters of eugenics. Even uh, W.E.B. DuBose was a supporter of eugenics, although he rejected a lot of the racist aspects of this school of thought. And they is, there are a lot of racist aspects of this thinking. Let me just tell you this, though. In 1927, Fortune magazine ran a poll, and they found that two out of three respondents supported eugenic sterilization of so-called mental defectives. If you, are judged, if you are deemed insane or feeble by doctors, then you should be sterilized. 63% of Americans in 1927 supported the sterilization of criminals. Only 15% opposed sterilizing both criminals and so-called mental defectives. And please know that before World War II, this was taught in high schools. This was taught in university. The need for eugenics and the belief in eugenics was greatly, greatly, greatly spread through higher education. Eugenics. Eugenics is the self-direction. Remember, Mother Nature can't do it anymore. We have to do it ourselves of human evolution. Like a tree, eugenics draws its materials from many sources and organizes them into an harmonious entity. This woman will not marry this man because he can't prove that he doesn't have insanity in his family, alcoholism in his family. These are all the things that you have to look into. You have to research who you are going to breed with, who are you going to marry in order to Ensure that your progeny, your offspring, will be fit. My grandfather had an uncle. It's a true story. My grandfather had an uncle who was a doctor. He's a young doctor, and he's making good money. Um, this is back in Germany, back in the 1920s. Anyways, he married a woman who was from a much higher class, very wealthy, because she couldn't find a suitor from her class, her upper class, because she had insanity in the family. And my grandfather's uncle said, I don't care, let's get married. And so he was able to go up a class and she had to go down a class uh, because people wouldn't marry into her family because insanity ran in it. Physical uh, 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 deformities, et cetera, would prevent you from a so-called good marriage in many circles in Europe and the United States. Scientists and followers of eugenics introduced a grading system. A so-called idiot is mentally about a three-year-old. Uh, three All he can really worry about is self-preservation. Self-preservation. Then you have high-grade imbecile. You can complete manual work, etc. These are the scales that they're using. They also examine brains, uh, the measurements of the skull, Long before Nazi Germany uh, 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 has its own eugenics program, we are experimenting and, 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 and supporting eugenics. In 1917, in 1917, a film comes out. And this film certainly couldn't come out today. What happens? What happens is that a doctor in this film allows a child who is so-called unfit to be born. He saves his life. Mother Nature didn't want this baby to be born. He saves the child's life. And what does a child do? Grows up and hunts down the doctor. How dare you allow me to live? That's the moral here. You're actually doing this child a disservice if you save him because he's going to have a life of misery, would, uh, a follower of eugenics would say. He's going to let her baby die. This woman says, it's for the best. Does humanity demand the saving of defective babies? Asks the Chicago Daily Tribune. 
doctor to let defective baby expire unaided. Eugenicists had halls at county fairs educating people on the need for proper breeding within society. How long are we Americans to be so careful for the pedigree of our pigs and chickens and cattle and then leave the ancestry of our children to chance or to blind sentiment? This person asks this. As farmers, you breed the best corn with the best corn and you get better corn. Do we not? Why don't we do that with humanity? This is what a supporter of eugenics would point to. This sign is up at a eugenics exhibit. Some people are born to be a burden on the rest. Learn about heredity. You can help to correct these conditions. The box up top says this light flashes every 15 seconds. Every 15 seconds, $100 of your money goes to the care of persons with bad her heredity, such as insane, feeble-minded criminals and other defectives. Every 48 seconds, a person is born in the United States who will never grow up mentally beyond that stage of a normal eight-year-old boy or girl. Every 50 seconds, a person is committed to jail in the United States. Very few normal persons ever go to jail. We want less of these, says this. We want more on the other side. Every 16 seconds, a person is born in the United States. However, only every seven and a half minutes, a high-grade person is born with the ability to do creative work and be fit for leadership. Only about 4% of Americans come within this class. We want less of the left-hand column and more of the right-hand column. Oregon's perfect baby girl is a triumph for eugenics. They would have fit family contests where the whole family would be inspected, measured. They would look at your mental ability, your physical ability. We want, this is positive eugenics. So we cut, we lessen people breeding who are deemed unfit and we promote families like this one. Better Baby Contest, 1931, Indiana State Fair. State by state begins compulsory sterilization legislation. State by state. In 1907, Indiana became the first state to enact forcible sterilization. 30 states will follow with California leading the way. One third of all sterilizations will happen in California from 1909 to the 1960s. 60,000 women mostly will be sterilized in this country, uh, about a third of them in California. Virginia has a landmark case. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court. This is Carrie Buck. Carrie Buck was deemed by the state to be slow-witted. She's on government assistance. They want to forcibly sterilize Carrie Buck. She fights this in Buck versus Bell. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court. I don't want to be sterilized. Well, oh, by the way, this is a Lifetime movie. You can see how Hollywood tends to change things in certain ways. Not quite the spitting image. Well, the state goes into her family history and they show they show that they have a very long history of being so-called feebles and being on government assistance. The Supreme Court rules against Carrie Buck. She will be sterilized. And Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said three generations is enough. How much longer must the state and society support Carrie Buck and the thousands of others that are just like her? She's sterilized. This is a map showing which states either have sterilization programs or will enact sterilization programs by 1935. Overwhelmingly, it was women who were targeted and the poor who were targeted. You could be sterilized for, again, being deemed slow-witted, an alcoholic, chronically lazy, meaning you do not seek employment and choose to live on aid. These are the sorts of things that could get you sterilized. 
sterilizations, forced sterilizations will exist in this country into the 1960s when finally it is done away with. Finally, the labor movement. The labor movement. Women will play a very strong role in trade unions in this country, especially middle class and upper class women. They'll get involved. It, it is 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 seen as their duty to join their 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 female counterparts from the working classes. One way in which progressive women help the labor movement was with the founding of the Union Trade, the, sorry, the Women's Trade Union League. What this was, what this was, it was made up of of, of middle class and upper class women and working class women and it was a way to aid women that are seeking better wages seeking more rights seeking safer conditions these middle class women formed this organization to aid in uh, working class women if you go on strike well who is going to bring you lunch who is going to maybe even help pay some of your bills well we will the women's trade union league very very progressive This organization will grow. This organization will help striking workers in New York, Philadelphia. The New York shirt waist strike. This was a massive strike involving approximately 20,000, mostly Jewish female workers in the city of New York. They're on strike for better working conditions and safer, better working conditions and uh, increased wages. Now, this strike, by the way, a shirt waist is one of these very popular. The work was very hard and very long. You didn't get paid much. Middle and upper class women will donate uh, money. Uh, they will help in legal representation of these striking workers. And they'll even participate in the picketing lines of these working class, mostly Jewish women in New York. This strike, by the way, for the most part, fails. But it's a perfect example of upper and a uh, uh, middle class progressive women helping their working class counterparts. Tragedy occurred in 1911 in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. This fire really helped labor in this country because it shined a light on how terrible some of these working conditions were for industrial workers. What happened was this. These women worked in the shirtwaist factory, young women, teenagers, women in their 20s, for the most part. The employers, the bosses, would lock the stairwell. They'd lock the door to prevent women from taking too many breaks, going out for a cigarette. A fire breaks out on the floor below these women and they can't escape. They can't escape. As the fire department is sent out, the women crowded on fire escapes fall to their deaths. This is glass on the sidewalk. You'll see this in old towns because there's rooms underneath a lot of these buildings and it allows light to shine through. That comes from a body hitting the ground like rain. These poor women, 150 of them began falling down some jump to their deaths just to escape the fire. There's a chance I'll survive. This shocks the country. Something needs to be done. How many more have to die? The funerals for these women were massive events. Hundreds of thousands of people came out to pay their respects and to mourn these working class women. 
This is an anti-capitalist bit of propaganda. Profit, rent. Who suffers? The worker. There is the wealthy capitalist shoving that door closed. The men responsible for that locked door received very, very light punishment. Child labor reform. Many members of the progressive movement, including a great many women, begin to demand child labor reform. According to the 1900 U.S. Census, a total of 1.7 million children between the ages of 5 and 10 were working. About one in six children ages 5 to 10 were working in this country, mostly from poor families, immigrant families as well, because we had to. Wages weren't high enough. The National Child Labor Committee was formed in 1907 to try to bring about real legislation that's going to fix this. We need to ban child labor in this country. Two million child workers under 16 years today. We want them to be normal men and women. You see, this is a cycle of poverty because these kids are not going to be educated. And what will happen? What will happen? They will have large families and their children will work and not be educated. We need to fix this. Laws need to be passed to fix this. That's a very progressive idea. Child labor is a national menace. Shall we let the industry shackle the nation? What these reformers do is they send out photographers and reporters to shine a light on this. This is muckraking. This is muckraking. These are beautiful photographs. I have way too many, but you'll have to bear with me. Highlighting what's going on in American factories, in American mines, in American mills. This kid is not going to be educated. These children will not be educated. And if they're hurt, they're cast aside. And they get paid a fraction of what working men do. It's a great photograph. By the way, labor unions will also support child labor reform laws because working men don't want to have to compete with kids who work for pennies. Most of these, by the way, are Lewis Hine, H-I-N-E. If you want to see more of these, simply type in child labor, Lewis Hine. Very dangerous work. And kids were employed oftentimes, too, because they could fit within the machinery, picking up loose lint like in a mill. Very dangerous work. This kid's at an oyster fishery. Shining shoes. Looks like chimney sweeps. A barber. The thing you notice, too, with a lot of these kids is how tired they look. Working long days, 12, 14 hours. Some newspaper boys, newsies, as they were called. That kid's what? Six tops picking cotton in the southern sun. Look how tired that kid looks.
Time and time again, laws were introduced to bring about real child labor reform. And time and time again, they fail. They fail. It will take, it will take the Great Depression to bring about real child labor reform, meaning if you're under 16 and it's not a family business and it's not an agriculture, you can't work. It takes the Great Depression because we need those jobs for men who feed their families. And so it's not until the Depression, 1934, that we see real changes come to legislation banning child labor. In our next lesson, we are going to war. The United States will enter the First World War. Uh, and what follows is transform transformative and absolutely deadly. Uh, we will examine the First World War and America's entrance into it in our next lesson. Thank you so very, very much until we meet again.